Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Surviving Scientology Radio with your host, Jeffrey Augustine. Today we have on with us Aaron Smith-Levin. We're going to be talking about why it can take some people up to 20 years to go from the state of clear to the state of OT. In the we have some other interesting details of how Scientology actually works in real life inside the church as opposed to the uh, PR messages, and also some interesting conflicts and things that really, how Scientology really works. I think you'll find it fascinating. We did some pre-recording today, so we're going to go right into the pre-recorded segment. Aaron, for our new listeners, could you give the, your background in Scientology? So I was um, raised in Scientology. I was about four years old when my mom got into it. Um, I worked on staff and in the Sea Org full-time uh, from the age of 12 to 26. Um, I, I officially left Scientology uh, 2014. Um, I'm now the vice president of the Aftermath Foundation, which is a nonprofit uh, set up to help people that are leaving Scientology. Um, second generation, none of my parents' parents were involved, other than maybe having read yeah. Dianetics. Uh, the reason I wanted to, to talk to you today, you made an interesting comment in your Facebook group the other day that you know a woman who has been in the church for 40 years and she just went clear. How does that happen? Well, she went clear about 20 years ago or attested to clear, but she just did OT one through three. So there was a 20 year gap between when she attests to clear and when she starts her OT levels when, um, you know, once you go clear, getting onto your OT, OT levels is what you're supposed to do right away. Um, OK, but again, your question still stands is how, how does that happen? Um, yeah, there's there's a number of reasons. So there's actually. A lot of auditing that needs to get done uh, between the state of clear and this and starting your OT levels if you haven't already had that auditing before going clear and where this gets um, uh, I guess a little I mean there's no way of talking about this subject without getting into the the weeds and the complications of it so we might as well just do it is sure, you know yeah. Scientology has what it calls its bridge to total freedom but there's a hell of a lot of auditing that exists in Scientology that actually has nothing to do with going up the bridge. So sometimes you'll hear Scientologists talk about bridge auditing specifically, which means it's literally your next step on the bridge. But there's a lot of auditing that doesn't even have a place on the bridge. It's just, um, it's just other stuff. Those are called non-bridge actions. Exactly. And uh, I think the vast majority of those non-bridge actions at this point um, is called the false purpose rundown, which is basically just, you know, people who've been watching Scientology for a while, they know of this concept called a sec check or a security check. And that's the style of auditing that's really just more like an interrogation, right? You're having uh, the auditors trying to get the pre-clear to um, divulge all the, the bad things that they've done. Um, and there's a lot of auditing. Most bridge auditing is not really sec checks. It's, it's a different style of auditing. Sec checks is really what I think non-Scientologists hear uh, the most about because it's probably the most unpleasant wow. part of Scientology. <laughs> and, and so your regular sec check is just basically getting the PC to uh, divulge all of these terrible things that they've done. But then you have uh, uh, the false purpose rundown style of sec checking which is you get someone to divulge something bad that they've done, and then you get them to look for what was the evil purpose or destructive intention that caused them to do that destructive act. So this is like an extra step. And then once they find that evil purpose or destructive action, you then have to have them find the earliest moment they had. Uh, um, I, I might be getting uh, this a little messed up, but bear with me. Um, you, uh, there's two ver ways this process can go, and I'm going to get it wrong because it's been a while. You either, once they just divulge the destructive act, you get them to locate the earliest time they have done something like that. And that usually goes back millions and millions of years. And then once they find what they think is the earliest moment they've done a destructive act like that, then you find what was the evil purpose or destructive intention that caused you to commit that over. And then you find what was misunderstood just prior to that. Now, this is a much more time consuming and complex version of sec checking than just a normal sec check. And yet there are um, there's a there are forms that L. Ron Hubbard put together with tons and tons of questions um, called the FPRD forms. So it's basically literally a sheet with dozens and dozens of questions that uh, need to be audited on a pre clear FPRD style. And he breaks these down for each dynamic. 
And, you know, there's eight dynamics in Scientology and there's FPRD forms for each dynamic. And there's also FPRD forms for each subject. Um, and a subject could be like staff or Sea Org or, um, and you could even just have any sec check, any sec check form that L. Ron Hubbard created could simply be done FPRD style. And a case supervisor, who's the person that decides what uh, pre-clear's next auditing action is, can also just write up their own FPRD sec check questions for an individual, and that's called a tailor-made FPRD sec check. So if you've attested to clear and you have not yet received a lot of FPRD, you now have to get all this FPRD before you start OT1. And... Um, and again, I know this is getting really into the weeds, but between clear and between sure. starting your OT levels, there's two categories of things that a pre-clear needs to finish. One is called their OT preparations and the other is called their OT eligibility. And OT preparations is basically where the case supervisor goes, all right, we need this person to get as much auditing as they're supposed to get, uh, you know, however the CS decides that. And then eligibility is, okay, we need to make sure this person is as ethical as we want them to be. These are considered two different subjects. They need to complete all of this auditing. And then after that, we need to make sure they meet our ethics qualifications to get onto the OT levels. So before anyone can do OT eligibility, they have to finish OT preparations. And OT preparations consist of a unbelievable amount of FPRD. And that's even if you're just a paying public. If you were on staff or if you were in the Sea Org, you actually have to get a lot more FPRD than if you had never been on staff or been in the Sea Org. This is one of these really weird things in Scientology where it's like the more you contribute and the more you've actually done for the church, the more you're actually treated like you are a bad person. Like you, like you can have a public <laughs> who, who literally has never yeah. done anything for the church other than give them money. And, you know, by the time they get on, have to get onto their OT levels, it's like, woo, let's just let them on with as little um, OT eligibility as possible. But if you spent 10 years on staff and then you left, they're like, oh, this guy's a real piece of shit. We're going to have to work him over the coals. He's going to have to get a full sec check on his whole staff career. They don't go, oh, great. Thank you for putting in 10 years of work. We're going to let you on to your OT levels quickly. It's like, oh, no, this guy's, this guy's got crimes. We're, we're, this guy's got crimes. He's going he's gonna to have a long road ahead of him. Because, um, you know, if you're on staff or in the Sea Org, one of the things that you're accumulating is knowledge reports that people have written on you <laughs> about all the terrible things they think you did. Whether it's talking back to your senior or you didn't show up to post on time or, you know, you you were too harsh in how you spoke to a public or something. It's just one of these funny things where the more time you spend working for the church, the fatter your ethics file is. Um, and so let's see, where was I going with all that? Oh, point out the person that we were talking about. She's born and raised in Scientology. Her parents are Scientologists. And she she joined the Sea Org at a very, very young age. Um, I mean, she's my age, so I mean, she's probably not even 40. And um, and yet she's been, quote unquote, clear uh, the entire time I've known her, which is close to 20 years. So she spent she spent over a decade in the Sea Organization. Her job in the Sea Org, she actually worked at the Advanced Organization in L.A. Her job was to get public onto the OT levels, even though she wasn't OT herself. <laughs> So yeah. <laughs> she spent years and years and years helping people get onto the OT levels, and yet she never did it herself. And then she left the Sea Org. She moved here to Clearwater with her husband, who also left the Sea Org with her. And they've been here in Clearwater, Scientologists in good standing, uh, working for a company that's owned by a Scientologist. And she's been here for 10 years now, and she's just she just finished OT 1, 2, and 3. Um, and so your original question was, how does that happen? Um, everything I've just explained is only a part of how that happens. There is another part of that answer too, but what was your question? Okay, here, here's an interesting thing, Aaron, we were talking about um, the other day. You, you mentioned when you look at false purposes or, or a lot of things in Scientology auditing, yeah. you have to be able to go back into past lives. You have to be able to go on what's called the whole track billions, quadrillions of years ago. Yeah. So my question when we were talking the other day, what happens when someone, uh, when a Scientologist has no reality on past lives, can't run a whole track, can't go to, to past lives? What happens? Is that a fundamental barrier? How, how does that work? So, it, uh, yeah, it makes them very difficult to audit. Um, and this is, uh, uh, this is one of the functions that the lower bridge 
performs or, or serves this function um, is because on the lower bridge is sort of where you train a pre-clear into the practice of recalling past lives and being convinced that they're real. So, uh, you know, in Scientology, they would call mm. it like being able to run um, whole track with high reality. So if someone goes, well, what does high reality mean? High reality means you're not questioning whether it's real. Like when pre-clears first start, um, I, I'm going to say being pressured to recall a past life incident, they, they, they're usually very uncomfortable doing it because to them, it's just an imagination. They're just making it up, which let's be honest, is probably what's happening. And so the auditor has to like encourage or entice the pre-clear like, no, it's okay. It's okay. And they'll do that's that's one of the ways they'll use the e-meter. You know, the prequel will be like, well, I'm getting an image of this, but I, I don't think it's real. The auditor will sort of um, give them a tacit. No, it's OK. Keep going. The, the meter is basically indicating that this is real. I mean, that's not literally what the auditor says, but it's how the auditor is using the meter. You know, carry on. What do you see next? What do you see next? And so once a preclear stops questioning the reality of these um, incidents, they become much, much easier to audit. And so um, on the lower bridge, you have the grades. And then after the grades, you have new era Dianetics. Now, new era Dianetics is where pre-clears get the most experience um, going deep whole track with, and doing it until they're running it at a level of high reality. And what was happening in Scientology is instead of pre-clears doing new era Dianetics and then going clear, an awful lot of pre-clears, including, I don't know, fucking like 70% of the people in my generation were attesting to last life clear. And um, we don't have to get into a whole discussion about how that happens, but they were basically being um, saying, I think I went clear in my past life. Um, and after various ways of, uh, you know, verifying that, Someone says, yes, you're right. You did go clear in your last life. And then they get to wear a bracelet and have a green stripe on their folder. And they never, they never have to run new era Dianetics. So you had this whole generation of Scientologists who had never gone past life with high reality, who were now starting the OT levels and expected to run these incidents of body things being blown up in volcanoes 76 trillion years ago. And they're like, what the fuck is this? None of this seems real. You know, like yeah, Aaron, that is so fascinating for a couple of reasons. <clears throat> now, now let, let me break it down going one step. So in the lower grades, you're acquainted with past lives and the, the auditor's kind of saying, well, no, that's reading on the meter. Now, now yeah. more fundamental than past lives, I'm asking you, is the idea in Scientology that if it reads on the meter, it's true. Would that be correct statement? Well, it, it depends on the context. It doesn't literally mean it's true, but it, it, it lends if, if the pre-clear is saying something and yeah, the meter reads in a particular way. Yeah, the auditor could use that to indicate what you're saying is is valid. This this is valid. OK, so let's say you have a, a low level Scientologist who has no reality on past lives or whole track, right? Yeah. But the, the auditor can say, no, this is reading on the meter. The e-meter uh, gives the pre-clear a point of reality that no this this device is actually in indicating something i didn't know about i do have past lives i do go back in time i'm an immortal spiritual being who's lived many times before so the e-meter will serve to reinforce that that core oh, doctrine yeah. of scientology what i'm saying is that that's how useful the e-meter is because it it it's presented to the scientologist as a scientific device that yeah. reads the subconscious that reads the Satan or the being. So, yeah. for, so first, so first, you have an actual device that's foundational to Scientology, and then that device is used to reinforce gradiently by steps that yes, you do have past lives. I know people who say, "Well, I seem to imagine this, but I think it's just a dream or an imagination." And, and, and I know people have been in Scientology, and then and then one day I just popped. I went, "Oh yes." I have lived before. And for them, that was a big breakthrough or jump in their ability to audit, like, as you said. Exactly. And that, so uh, interesting to me that when you, you had, what you just said was amazing because you had people attesting, I was a past life clear. And that let them out of doing, doing a lot of work. But like you said, if they don't have a reality on it for the subjective personal reality, when they get to OT3, it's like, this is just not, what the hell's going on, right? So once they get with the program, and once they have this experience they lived before, they're a lot, then, then they really can be, again, serious auditing, right? 
That's right. And, you know, these people who are saying I went clear in my past life, you know, the auditing that gets done to sort of, quote unquote, verify that is only dealing with the past life, which in many cases for these people was like 20 years ago. That's a lot different than two billion years ago. <laughs> I mean, what's funny is these young Scientologists, they've already been exposed to so much information about what's happened in Scientology over the last 50 years. You know, they've, you know, they've listened to uh, people tell stories about the old days in the Washington, D.C. org or the old days at St. Hill or the old days in L.A. And so these people are basically it. it it's not crazy for them to come up with quote unquote memories about a period in which they've already heard tons of stories about, you know? Um, so do you see what I'm saying? They're recalling things, but they're recalling things about which they actually have a frame of reference. Well, you know? Oh, sure. It'd be like, you know, I, 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 I'm a, I'm a, a baby boomer. So I grew up around uh, a, a lot of people who were in world war two, a lot of, uh, a lot of older people in my family, friends of families, you know, I mean, just a lot of men who were in World War II. So I had a very high reality on being in World War II. Now that right. could lend itself to me believing that I was in World War II and I was killed. And, exactly. and the reason I mention this is, is something that goes on, on on online and chat boards. There was a period where a lot of um, Scientologists, former members, where they were talking about they were German soldiers in the past. They were Nazis. They were Americans. And and one of the recurring motifs in in, in Scientology auditing is being killed in battle. And it mm. might even be from it might even be from reading books and things. Uh, for for myself, uh, past lives real to me, right? Mm -hmm. But I know I realize that's a subjective belief that I wouldn't enforce on anybody else. It just seems to be the case. You know how I experience life, right? Mm -hmm. But I know other people who are atheists, and to, to them, that's just bullshit, right? But I, I I don't have an argument because there's the subjective nature of human consciousness, objective nature, right? Uh, but in Scientology, the ability to run whole track, like you said, is, is essential. And, and, and another thing we were talking about to jump to something else, when you get to clear, you suddenly, re, L. Ron Hubbard tells you that clears are in danger. So let's switch gears. Why are clears in danger? Well, it's funny because even when a clear goes clear and then they get basically shown this letter from Ron that was like, now you're at high risk. You must get onto the OT levels immediately. Even the clear being given that letter has no fucking idea why they're being told they're at risk. They're just being told they're in this, you know, <laughs> like why? Because they don't, they don't know. Well, they don't know at the time that it's really just a sales technique to like take someone mm. who now feels fantastic. You know, once someone's told they're clear, they usually feel fucking great for a few weeks or a few months. And so, but what happens when someone feels absolutely great? Well, now they don't think they need any more auditing. <laughs> but but if, if they don't feel like they need any more auditing, then how do you sell them all the auditing you still want to sell them? So, you know, Hubbard's got this letter like, now you're at risk. You must urgently get onto the OT levels. And so when you say, well, why are they at risk? I guess the question is, why is L. Ron Hubbard saying they're at risk? Why are they, you know, what, why do they think they're at risk? Because the next, uh, you know, the OT levels are now about learning about the Xenu story and learning about all the body phaetons and learning that whereas what was wrong with you was your reactive mind. Now that you've gotten rid of your reactive mind, what's really wrong with you is you've got tens of thousands of degraded spirits stuck to you and they all have their own reactive minds and their reactive minds, and they are now affecting your thoughts, feelings, and emotions, and even your physical health. Now, uh, if, uh, you know, now that we're no longer involved in any of this anymore, you can go, I'm sorry, why are you more susceptible to those factors now that you don't have a reactive mind than you were when you did have a reactive mind? What, how could you possibly be more at risk now than you were before? None of it makes sense. But it's one of these things where if someone from a position of authority like L. Ron Hubbard is now saying, you're at risk, and he's not even telling you why, you just take it as a matter of faith. The ironic thing is Scientologists don't believe that there's anything involved in Scientology requires faith. Um, but li literally, they're just being told, now you're at risk. I'm not going to tell you why, but you better, you better do your next auditing quickly, man.
So it's almost hard yeah, to this, answer your yeah, question, is, like, why are they at risk? They're not at risk. It's all kind of just a sales technique. But but let's stay within the the, the Scientology mindset, because what I, I remember um, when I was getting all the Scientology junk mail up through around 2007, before they took me off their list, there was a lot of advertising for if you're clear, you're in danger, and you've got to get up and on to your OT levels. And mm -hmm. and for, for people not familiar with Scientology, you know, the whole goal when you initially go in is to go clear. Yeah. That's the big deal to lose your reactive mind. And that way you don't have all the engrams, chains, locks, secondaries, all that hardware, you know, uh, hanging you up and you're, you're clear. You've rehabilitated, you, you've rehabilitated all these abilities and, you know, you're clear. And so when I, when I said, when I read that clears are in danger, I knew the danger was that, you know, the, uh, the OT case, the body Satan's, right? Yeah. That whole incident. And so it was, it, to me, it was, you're, you raised the exact right question. Well, if I went clear, I should be in good shape, present time, able to do things. I can think clearly. I have no aberrations. But then, but then Hubbard throws this curveball at you. You've got to get, get to OT levels, right? Now, yeah. going back to your friend, she took 20 years. So she was in danger for 20, <laughs> she was in danger for 20 years. Yeah. In, in mortal peril for 20 years because... Because why does it take 20 years? One thing that uh, uh, Flag advertises in their, their their source magazine is speed of bridge progress. Yeah, They're always pushing that. If you come arrive at Flag and their speed up the bridge. Yeah. <laughs> and so you know you read about these people. Now another contradiction. L. Ron Hubbard warns about what are called quickie grades. You know, rushing people through the and Flag sells speed up the bridge. Yet the reality, it's, it's like it's like when you buy, you know, when you go to buy a car, right? They, you, they can load you up with all kinds of options that you didn't want. Or, but, yeah. you know, it's like, well, we got to do undercoating. We got to do this. We want to add that. You want to add this suspension, this towing package for your truck, air conditioning, sound system. It's like, it's almost like when you go and you think you're going to go clear in the OT, but then it's 20 years or five years or whatever it is. What? What took her so long? Was all that false purpose rundown? Was she? Did she have many false purposes? What kept her from her OT well, eligibility? She, what are the factors that can? Yeah. Well, as we will touch on a few things, but probably the most important thing is that uh, she wasn't a public. <laughs> so you know, staff members and Sea Org members uh, really get almost no time to actually go up the bridge on the auditing side. Because the truth is in Scientology, one, there just aren't that many auditors. And the ones that are around are usually assigned to audit the public because that's how Scientology makes its money. And it's very rare, even these days, honestly, to have auditors specifically assigned to audit the staff. And the, the auditors who usually end up auditing the staff are the auditors who are just doing their training courses and they need you know people to practice on. But... Um, that's those people doing that training are usually learning how to be auditors at the lower levels. Um, they're not, they're not there to get people onto the OT levels. Like uh, a class nine auditor who can, or a class eight or class nine auditor who can um, deliver the OT levels. Those guys don't audit staff members. <laughs> there aren't just class eight and class nine auditors lying around to audit staff members. So she was in the Sea Org for most of. Uh, uh, at least the first 10 years that she, after she went clear, she was in the Sea Org. And there's just not a big push to get Sea Org members up the bridge. It's considered that Sea Org members are on the business end of the E-meter. The public are on the uh, other end of the E-meter. And Sea Org members are sort of told, you are, you are already OT. You, you know, you are already OT because your cause, you know, as a Sea Org member, your cause over life. Uh, we're here to help the public who aren't, you know. It's almost like, I, I believe Hubbard had said a couple places, the fastest way to go OT is to just be OT. And I guess they sort of take that to the extreme in the Sea Org. Like the Sea Org members aren't walking around going, oh, gee, if I could only do my OT levels, I would be better at my post. Sea Org members just don't hmm. really think that way. And um, now look, you and I, not being involved in any of this anymore, can understand that the fact that there's no emphasis to get the staff and the Sea Org up their OT levels, um, it's just a function of the fact that this is all really kind of a giant scam. <laughs> you, know, you, you get the people sure. to work for you for nothing in return for nothing and, and make them th think they're awesome for it while 
you know, you, you keep accepting all the money from the paying public who will pay you top rates. If they truly, truly believed in the fact that getting people up the OT levels is the only thing that's going to save this planet, then they would just shut the doors for a few months and give a, get all the staff up the goddamn OT levels. But we, we know why that doesn't happen. Well, sure. And what's interesting, it, it, when you look at how uh, L. Ron Hubbard built Scientology, clear was everything. You know, he in the 1950s and 1960s, there were different routes to clear. He was developing the way to go to clear. The first clear made by someone else other than himself was in 1958, although he said he made clears in 47. So you know, clear clear was defined. Once he got his mind around that and people began to go clear, he had to have something else to sell. So there in, what is it, 1967 in Las Palmas, he writes the OT, OT3 levels. And, yeah. and then that's, that's the next new thing. In ter- as a businessman, I've always seen the OT levels as a product line expansion. To become clear, you have to have the clear cognition and then it would be natural that you would you know hubbard discovered he said this other whole dangerous thing he said that um and this is how you roll out a product for him um he found the trap that we've been stuck in for the last 75 million years right now What's what's interesting in Scientology marketing, once sh- they'll advertise publicly that anyone can read it, whether you're a brand new Scientologist or you're clear, they'll talk about on the OT levels you learn what's been holding us, you know, captive for the last 75 million years. When you mm-hmm. first saw that and you didn't and you didn't know about the OT levels, was that tantalizing to you as a Scientologist? Oh, it was so tantalizing. I mean, sometimes I felt like I was about to lose my mind if I couldn't, if someone wouldn't fucking tell me what was on these OT levels, my head was going to explode. I mean, even though I didn't love getting auditing when I was in Scientology, I really didn't like getting auditing. I really wanted to know what was on those OT levels. And for me, as a, a second generation member, the concept of those OT levels or the, the promise uh, that the, the hype that they had been given really is what kept me in Scientology as long as I stayed in. Like, even though I didn't see auditing, like particularly making anybody better, I could see auditing. I saw auditing make a lot of people happier. And that was a temporary state. Um, I never actually saw auditing make anybody more competent. Uh, I never, you know, uh, uh, but, and yet the mystery sandwich about these OT levels was so strong that it helped me look past the evidence in front of me that auditing was not everything it was cracked up to be. I was like, I don't know what's wrong with, you know, this level of auditing, but those OT levels, I need to get me some of that. Um, And uh, so, yes, everything he said about the OT levels, you know, every now and then he would make mention of in researching into the upper OT levels, I found basically how to bring, how to revive the dead. I was like, what? (laughs) Wow. (laughs) And so, you know, the OT levels were the ultimate product expansion. And then, and then eventually Miscavige had to come out with superpower as the, as the next uh, product line expansion. And once the majority of Scientologists get through superpower, which I think they're probably close to it by now, he's going to have to get clever and come up with something for OT 9 and 10. And that will probably be Miscavige's biggest, uh, biggest coup is pulling that one off. Because I suspect whatever he comes up with after OT 9 and 10, once Scientologists do that, I think he's kind of fucked. I, I think I think people start yeah, you Scientology know, in th- droves after that point. Well, yeah, if, you, if you've been a long-term Scientology watcher or you've been in Scientology for a long, long time, I went, you know, in, in the uh, not you know just reading the history of it in the uh, in the late sixties when the OT levels rolled out, that was the big, big deal to go to OT seven because they didn't have OT eight at the time, right? And then uh, after the OT levels, uh, Ron rolled out the L's. You know, the L's were rolled out as the next big case cracking thing, right? Yeah. And then OT8, they bought the ship so they could have OT8, which really they bought the ship uh, so they could have the IAS offshore, keep all the money <laughs> in an offshore right. location. Yeah. And But it's, it's just fascinating. What, go, going back to what you said, the allure of what's up there on the OT levels when you're in yeah. Scientology is that that's a powerful 
a powerful mystery that can really it's keep a, you in the church saying, if I can just get there. It is. And I'll tell you what, um, uh, that mystery and that allure is so, so strong that it also leads to a huge disappointment. And it's amazing that, um, that the, the way they keep Scientologists from, let's say, spreading their disappointment about what they do on each OT level is even talking to another Scientologist about your OT levels, even another Scientologist who's already done the OT levels, even talking to another Scientologist about the OT levels is enough to get you permanently barred from doing any further auditing and could even get you kicked out of Scientology. They consider it that important. And that is drilled home to every Scientologist before they start the OT levels and as they start each successive OT level, that it is strictly forbidden to discuss any of your own auditing sessions or even the subject of the OT levels themselves with anyone else, again, including Scientologists who have already done it. So you don't hear the disappointment spreading from Scientologist to Scientologist, but if you're one of these young Sea Org members who worked at the advanced org, you see firsthand how hard it is to get people who've done OT3 to come back in and do OT4 and 5. It can be really hard. Um, you know, as people go up the OT levels, they end up leaving Scientology. And yes, some of them stick around and do the whole thing, but those are your most hardcore believers. And any group, no matter what you're selling, you could be selling buckets of shit, you're eventually going to have some percentage of people who for some reason are just hardcore believers. You know, you just you can't, you can't do anything to shake their belief. Um, and so there's one other aspect I wanted to mention to you here is this, this young generation of Scientologists. Uh, there's this mystery sandwich of OT. But like, for example, my mom had not done the OT levels when I was young, growing up in Scientology. So everything, all the magical stuff I heard about the OT levels, I was still able to go, oh, that, that, that could be true. There wasn't a ton of stuff staring me in the face to contradict that. I mean, and yet these young, a lot of these young Scientologists, they're growing up with parents who are OT5, five, uh, five, seven, or eight, and the ones who are in the Sea Org. They're, who are delivering to the public at the advanced orgs. They're seeing all these public who are OT3, 5, 7, and 8. They see firsthand that there's nothing special about these guys. They see firsthand that these people have just as many problems as everyone else. They're just as quote-unquote out ethics as everyone else. They're just whiny little bitches like everyone else in the world is. <laughs> Meaning they're not extra special. And so my point that I'm making there is, this young generation of Scientologists isn't exactly chomping at the bit to do the OT levels like maybe the earlier generation was. So someone like Marissa, um, well, now I said her name, that's fine, who was, uh, you know, who's been clear for 20 years, was in the Sea Org for 10 or 15 years, and then she gets out of the Sea Org and now she's a public Scientologist. She's not necessarily dying to do her OT levels. One, there's no evidence. She hasn't seen any evidence in her life that these things are anything special. Um, it's unbelievably expensive. And there's just no huge motivating factor to do them. So someone like, like that just kind of hangs around, does their, does their Dianetics course, does their books and lectures course, does their congresses, does their their ACCs, and we don't even have to bother defining all these things. There's plenty of things you can do in Scientology to keep you busy that doesn't actually have anything to do with moving you up the bridge. And, and here's something interesting to consider. One of the reasons Miscavige came out with this whole new lineup, and you know what I'm talking about. I don't really want to get into all the details, but he re-released every book and made every book its own course. He re-released every lecture series Hubbard ever gave and made it its own course. Whereas in the past, these books and these lecture series were part of other courses, longer courses. One of the problems he was solving is that Scientologists weren't actually doing their bridge. So he's like, well, let's break it up into a thousand different little things so that we can always say that someone's doing the bridge. We can make this book a course and they can do that course and we can say they're doing the bridge. Um, whereas let's say, let's just take yeah. the science of survival book, for example, you used to not be able to just do the science of survival book and lecture course. You had to literally do your professional auditor training to study science of survival, but there's a shitload of courses that you have to do before you're even allowed to start your professional auditor training. So you had a whole bunch of Scientologists who were sitting out there and it didn't actually look like they were doing anything because none of them want to put in the time and the effort it takes to actually go up the bridge. So Miscavige is like, Oh, okay. 
let's change this lineup and let's break it up into a million different pieces so that everybody can say they're quote unquote doing the bridge. It was almost his solution to a problem that there's not tons of interest in doing all this stuff. You know, Aaron, you have a, a wealth of material you just shared. One, when you say that the, the new generation of Scientologists have grown up around clears and OTs and yeah. they're not seeing anything spectacular. Yeah. Because when, 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 when clear was, uh, I'm sorry, when the OT levels were new and, you know, my, my generation, the boomers, you know, they had the promise of telepathy, all these OT powers. And there was yeah. even a thing about kill with a stare. That was some, that was a mystery that they wanted to pursue. But if you grew up around it, like me growing up at Pentecostal, uh, speaking in tongues was just like speaking in tongues. It was just taken for people outside of Pentecostalism, like viewed it as some freak show. And I understand that, you know, uh, but within my ch gifts of the Holy Spirit, healing, laying on of hands, demonic exorcism, prophecy, that was just like taken for granted, right? And yeah, and me being a young person, it was like, uh, there was all interesting stuff where you'd see it going on around you. But then you would see like, uh, you know, you'd, go, you'd leave a church service and then you'd see everyone go outside and uh, smoke cigarettes and, you know, kind of talk, you know, just kind of talk in ways you wouldn't expect Christians to talk. They'd be gossiping, talking about shit, you know, maybe they would even go out hunting as an excuse to drink. Right. So when you grow up, when you grow up in it, you know, if I were if I were 17 and I grew up in Scientology and it was right now 2020, I would not be that interested in going to even go. So this, the second thing too, uh, what's often asked of Scientologists is what did you think when you opened the OT3 course pack and read about Xenu and the body thetans and incident yeah. two of OT3, right? But, yeah. but, but even before that, a question that should be asked is what did you think when you went clear? Was it everything you thought it would be? Yeah. And, and I, I've interviewed a lot of Scientologists off the record and on the record. Uh, did, Aaron, did you go clear in Scientology? Never did. I thought I was past life clear, but I could never, I never received the, uh, the CCRD to, to verify if that was the case or not. So I never was, I was never, uh, I, I was never attested to the state of clear when I was in Scientology, even though I always thought that I was clear. Well, now how many CR members actually go clear? Is it a small percent? It is a small percentage, but, but remember these, these, um, these young Scientologists who quote unquote were attested to clear, remember, they didn't actually go clear. They're saying, I'm already clear. So they didn't even actually get a bunch of auditing. They're just like, and, and one of the reasons people were inclined to be like, yes, you are clear, is because these are people who are like 12, 13, 14, 15 years old, and they're already on staff. They're already on this in the Sea Org. So there's, a, there's this sort of group consensus that like, oh, look, he came back. He's a past life clear. That's why he's so damn young on staff because he was already a Scientologist. So that's how these things fit together. So um, uh, to answer your question, a, a very small percentage of Sea Org members go clear, but, but this generation I'm talking about, they didn't even quote unquote go clear. They just said, I'm already clear. <laughs> but now, Aaron, that's, that's, that's amazing to consider because it, Look at, and I like to see how Scientology actually works on a day-to-day -day basis on the ground, you know, the ground game. Yeah. It would be in the best interest of the Church of Scientology International to allow a lot of young people to attest to past life clear because then it would make it easier to bring them into the Sea Org to, yes. to get Scientology's free labor force. So if I'm, if I'm uh, David Miscavige or L. Ron Harbord, hey, attest away with when you're 12 years old that you were past life clear, I'll pat you on the back and let you wear a clear bracelet. And now we need you in the CR because you're OT. Yeah, and that works fantastically as if clear is the top of the mountain. But when you have all these people attesting to clear and they don't actually have any experience running deep whole track incidents with high reality, they get onto the OT levels and they completely fucking fail. They can't run the material. But let's, right, but let's distinguish between CR members and publics, okay? Yeah. So... If I want people to work for Sea Org, I tell them I accept their their that they attest that they were past life clears and they've come back, right? Yeah. And I make them feel like 
like a million dollars. Now you can go up and really do the work as a Sea Org member. You know, welcome yes. aboard, shipmate, as L. Ron Hubbard says. Now, I'm paying publics, people who don't want to join this, who are not attesting past that clear, then, it, yes. then I'm going to just let them spend all the money they want until they get a reality on whole track, until yes. they go clear, until they do their OT eligibility, because it's, it's just a cash register running, right? Yeah. And what's pretty amazing is it's a win-win for the Church of Scientology, because if you want to be a past life clear and go in the Sea Org, that's good for the church. If you want to be a paying public and take 20 years between clear and OT, that's great for the church. If yep. people are bogging and, and David Miscavige wants to break a, a complex a complex st series of study courses, are the police after you? <laughs> they caught me. No, it was just an ambulance going by. Now, <laughs> I thought it, was, it might have been the Scientology police. <laughs> Out of the car, SP. Uh, palms, let's see palms. Um, anyway, okay, so, so it's interesting how Scientology can – can win in either case, right? Put put second and third gen into Sea Org. Yeah. Put, you know, paying publics, let them take forever. But uh, going back to revisit one thing you said, when Miscavige broke, like like the St. Hale special briefing course took forever, right? Yeah. And you were talking about, you were talking about how to even to get to study science of survival took forever because it was embedded in another course. Yeah. So really, if you break, if you make, when, he, when David Miscavige launched the basics books and made every book a study course, made every lecture a study course, yeah. By by breaking down the, the long complex courses L. Ron Hubbard had created into smaller bite sized pieces. You're about to make the analogy to when they took the briefing course and they split it up into sixteen different courses. Uh, it's, exactly. It's the, it's the it is the same thing. Now when he re released all the books and the lectures, that also just happened to coincide with the expiration of the copyright on the previous works. So, you know, Miscavige <laughs> is a lot of things, but stupid isn't one of them. Uh, you know, this kind of solved a couple problems no, he's for not him at stupid. the same time. <laughs> Scientology can be so surreal, but but when you look at it from the business as a business, yeah, and what they're doing as a business, uh, Guy Racine once told me that David Miscavige was a marketing genius, yeah. and Guy was correct. He is a marketing yeah. genius. And when when OT8 was rolled out, you know, the, the, he had to withdraw because that was obviously uh, when when you read about Hubbard's words about Jesus Christ being a lover of young men and boys. Yeah. And L. Ron Hubbard being the Antichrist, that just blew up. That was one of Miscavige's mistakes. He should he should have followed his instincts and said, I'm not releasing this. Let's just kind of dial this way back. And that's what yeah, happened. Yeah. He yeah, had to retool. Yeah, he had to, yeah, he had to retool it because it's yeah. like, no, oh no, this one's a this one's a no go. <laughs> yeah. Did, so let now, me. No, go ahead. No, I was going to say. I mean, the blowback from there's nothing worse in business than a botched product launch, and and I've been through a few of those. Not a lot, but a couple. Right, where a, a, you launch a product and it craters. It's an embarrassment to your company, to you, if you, you know, and I've been on teams that launch, had botched product launches. So OTA was a botched product launch. The basics, on the other hand, was good for the church, but the public, a lot of the public membership pushed back. And they just didn't want to buy $5,000 libraries of books they already owned. It was right. like a big money grab, right? Yeah. And, um, it's true. There was a lot of um, there was a lot of pushback, and one of the reasons for these pushbacks is I don't know why Miscavige does this. He doesn't make these things optional. He makes them mandatory. So like even a class four auditor, because remember these um, the the re-release of these books and these lectures was really just uh, the precursor to then re-releasing all of the professional auditor training courses and telling everyone in the entire world who'd ever done them that they had to do them all again. And he'd already done this once in 1996, and then he did it again about 15, 20 years later. And my point here is that when he uh, – uh, so he releases the books and lectures. Uh, he's pushing all Scientologists to do them. But then – but at that point, they weren't mandatory. Like if you were already in the middle of your auditor training, you, you didn't have to stop your auditor training and go back and read Dianetics again. You were allowed to keep doing your auditor training. But then just a couple years later, he re-releases the second Golden Age of Tech. And he says, psych bitches, you have to redo all your auditor training. Oh, and by the way, before you can do your auditor training again, 
you've got to read all the books and lectures. So literally, so when he first launched the books and lectures thing, it was pretty much optional. And then he followed it up with the golden age of tech too. And all of a sudden, literally every person in the world was having to go back and read everything L. Ron Hubbard <laughs> ever wrote and said in chronological sequence in like a hundred separate courses. And that's where you get the pushback. The pushback is like, dude, I've been in Scientology for 50 years. I'm OT8. I'm a class eight auditor. And you're telling me not only have I never learned how to properly audit before, but I've never even understood what Hubbard wrote in Dianetics before. And I've got to go back and do it again. I mean, it's fucking crazy from a product launch perspective, but I think it serves a whole other purpose. These golden age of tech evolutions, these, these successive evolutions that he does, there is something else that accomplishes that's more important to David Miscavige than um, even the ultimate success of the Church of Scientology. Each one of these successive evolutions weeds out people who are more loyal to the sure. concept of L. Ron Hubbard than they are to the concept of David Miscavige, mm -hmm. right? Now, be, but, and, and, and the people who remain are the ones who see no separation between L. Ron Hubbard and David Miscavige. I mean, I was right in the thick of things when the first golden age of tech came out. And there was an awful lot of Scientologists who were like, this is not okay. This is not, this is in violation of what L. Ron Hubbard said. And then there were a lot of people who felt that way, but knew, knew better and kept their mouth shut. And then there were people who didn't feel that way. They were like, no, everything David Miscavige is doing is in lockstep with what L. Ron Hubbard would be doing if he were still here. And the fact that you think otherwise means there's something really, really wrong with you. So um, eventually Miscavige, when he does these things, these huge sweeping changes, the people who disagree, he gets fucking rid of them. And that's true for the public and the staff in the Sea Org. And he's left with people who are as loyal to him or more than they are to the idea of LRH. Because we now have a generation of Scientologists who never knew LRH. You know, the Mike Renders of the world sure. grew up with him. You know, even people in my mom's generation, you know, they, they knew LRH. They've, they met LRH, even if they didn't even if they all didn't personally meet him, it was at least possible they knew people who did and all that kind of stuff. We, we now have the generation where none of these guys knew LRH. The, the most they know of LRH is what they hear from David Miscavige, you know? Yeah, Aaron, let me jump in here because again, you, you offer a wealth of, of, of insights. Um, so Miscavige creates a new business model to sell the materials again, right? But yeah. But he's also using it as a culling mechanism to purge the old guard of people who were loyal to Ron. So, so there's the business model of Scientology, and then there's the ideological side yeah. of Miscavige, where he has to purge all the Hubbard, all the Hubbardites, right? Because he yeah. doesn't need them. You know, Scientology wants you in that life band from about, you know, 12 to 50, that life band where you're strong moving up, right? But, yeah. but once you get past 50 and you start weakening, God forbid, you, you, they don't really need you when you start weakening and you're getting getting older, right? And I, yeah, I, 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 I have a friend in uh, in uh, I, I have a friend who's older who said life is good as long as you don't weaken. Mm -hmm. And he's older, and I know exactly what he means. And Scientology, if you weaken or you have ideological preference for L. Ron Hubbard over David Miscavige, you're gone. Yeah, they, don't, they have no use for you. Don't want you because Scientology, well, Scientology is all about the able, you know, making the able more able, right? They talk about wherewithal as a yeah. code word for money, and and so it's interesting how Scientology, the business, Scientology, the uh, ideological fascist psychopolitical movement works. So you have you have a lot of a lot of density on this. Now, now one other question I wanted to ask. It can take you 20 years to go from clear to OT if you were in the Sea Org, right? If you're a sure. public, it can be quicker. But yeah. what happens? How does it happen that people hit OT7 or OT8? Suddenly, they have they're sent back down to the bottom of the bridge because well, that, what goes on when someone gets kicked back down to the bottom? What ha happens? Well, I guess there's a couple different ways that can happen. Um, for some, Miscavige got really obsessed with this idea that so many people who had attested to clear um, hadn't, you know, really given the proper clear cognition. And so there's a couple different ways that somebody could finish OT7 and quote unquote be sent back down to the bottom of the bridge. One way is someone can literally finish OT7, show up to the ship to start OT8, 
and be told, oh, by the way, we reviewed your folders and you're not actually clear. <laughs> <laughs> and then now it's well, not like fuck me. <laughs> now, it, what's funny is that in that situation, they're not actually made to redo all the OT levels. They're just made to go get a bunch of new era Dianetics auditing. But keep in mind, now they're on this ship where auditing is more expensive on the ship than anywhere else. And they didn't show up expecting to do new era Dianetics. They showed up expecting to do OTA. And they're like, psych, you're not clear. Um, you need to do new era Dianetics <laughs> until you go clear. And then we're going to let you start OTA. So they could be on the ship for three weeks getting new era Dianetics for like $6,000 in intense, uh, $6,000, you know, $500 an hour or whatever. And then they're like, Yay, you're clear. Okay, you can start OT8 now. Now, just realize, that doesn't make any sense. Like, uh, Halbert says that if you don't go clear, you will basically go crazy or die on the OT levels. And yet, you just let this person finish OT7. Like, you've just contradicted the entire fundamentals of this entire um, philosophy, if you will. Now, there's another way that someone can go back down to the bottom of the bridge. You finish OT8, and then they go... <laughs> This is just Miscavige making shit up at this point. Um, Miscavige goes, hey, guess what? We realized that nobody has ever properly run the objectives level of auditing. Now, objective means the physical universe, what things you can touch. Auditing, yeah. auditing anything higher than the objectives is called subjective auditing. Objective auditing is supposed to be done what you do on people who are in really bad case shape, uh, really bad shape case wise. And, and, and in Scientology, you assume that anybody who's never had auditing is in really bad shape. You do objective auditing because you can tell that the preclear is executing your auditing commands. That is literally the point. So it's like, so it's like touch, touch, touch the wall. The yeah, touch bottle. that wall, you know, touch that wall. Thank you. Turn around, walk, walk over to that other wall, touch that wall or, you know, pick up that vase. What is its color? What is its weight? There's there's a hundred different kinds of objective processes. But the point is, they're the processes that are done at the lowest, lowest levels of Scientology. It's to get a preclear accustomed to just being audited, to get accustomed to executing auditing command, to, to get accustomed to what it means to do an auditing session. I mean, uh, it, it's just to get a person to even start thinking about themselves as a spiritual being. And then you move on to subjective auditing. Well, Miscavige decided no one's ever properly done objectives before. And he also decided that even OTs can get amazing case gain from doing objectives auditing. So what the, way, the reason I'm describing it this way is that it, M Miscavige isn't literally telling an OT8, hey, by the way, I'm sending you back to the bottom of the bridge. It's almost like he, he decided how to remarket the objectives processes. He's like, yes, yes, we do objectives on people who are brand new, but that's not the only thing they're used for. You can also benefit from them. So you see, he's, re, he's repositioning the objectives. He's not actually, he's not actually saying, oh, hey, all you OT8s, um, we're sending you back to the bottom of the bridge. No, it's almost like, hey, guess what you guys get to do now? You guys get to do this new thing oh, that so we used more to case use for gain. this, but yeah, now we use it for OT case gain, you guys. Isn't that great? And again, this is one of those things where it's like if you're OT8 and you go, this is fucking bullshit, <laughs> then you're in trouble. Yeah. You're in trouble. And Misca it's almost like this. It's like this. If you're OT8 and you're still in Scientology, it's just because you actually believe OT9 and 10 are coming along. Because if you didn't believe OT9 and 10 were coming along, you wouldn't listen to a fucking thing David Miscavige told, said to you. He'd be like, okay, guys, now you got to do your objectives. You'd be like, suck my balls. I'm not doing anything you say. You have nothing I need anymore. Um, but look, as long as these OT8s believe that OT9 and 10 are coming, they'll do whatever the fuck Miscavige tells them to do. Because he's the one who has ultimate say over who gets to do OT9 and 10. And Aaron, I'd like to pick it up again on another show because there's so much wealth of material here. But I, here, here's what I'd like to end off with, because uh, yeah. this is all really intriguing to me, how it really works versus, you know, the, the PR. Yeah. There's a Hubbard wrote a policy letter called Responsibility of Leaders, right? Yeah. And to me, one of the most insightful things Ron ever said, he, he gave himself away, right? He says this, quote, when the game or the show is over, there must be a new game or a new show. And if there isn't, somebody else is jolly well going to start. And if you won't let anyone do it, the game will become getting you. 
unquote. Exactly. exactly. So it's sort of like both Mr. Hubbard and Mr. Miscavige have to give a new game all the time because Scientologists like novelty. The E-meter was novel when it came out. Yeah. It had never been done. So there always has to be a new game, right? Yeah. And of course, as Elrond Hubbard said, Scientology is the only game where everybody wins. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's true. I mean, it is uh, that responsibilities of leaders um, policy is so core to how Miscavige thinks. Um, it is so core to how the people around Miscavige behave and think. There's even um, a, a quote from that policy or an anecdote in that policy that's referred to colloquially in Scientology as pink legs, where it's almost like if you are close to a position of power and there's someone who is threatening that, that power of that person you're close to, you, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, of course, you shouldn't go and ask your boss what they want done about it or whether you want to have that person killed. That boss should just wake up one day and see the, you know, the pink legs of the dead body sticking out under the door. In other words, just go and take out whoever's threatening the power of your boss. Don't expect your boss to give you permission or approval because by doing that, you're basically pulling your boss down into the shit. Just do what you know needs to be done to protect the power of the person who you depend upon for your own power. It's called pink legs. And really in the Sea Org, it's just yeah, referred to as, yeah, and, as, oh my God, what should I do? What should I do? And, and the colloquial thing is pink legs. Go do what the fuck you know needs to be done. Stop waiting for permission. Stop, stop waiting for someone to tell you it's okay. Just go fucking do it. And that's from the responsibility of leaders policy. It, it is. And can we cover that in our next podcast about how power works in the Sea Org and in the church? Yeah, sure. Because I think the responsibility of leaders would be a great podcast. And I'm going to post it in the show notes. Yeah. And uh, to, your observation that that's core to how, how Miscavige thinks, I, I think is spot on. And it's because it was core to certainly how Hubbard think about how to keep the show going, right? And how, how to support and all these machinations that go on, including fair game, disconnection, child labor, you know, all the lies, all the cover up. Yeah, I know we're wrapping it up, but look, I was 14 yeah. years old the first time I read that policy and had to get checked out on it. And I was like, wait a second, Hubbard, Hubbard is saying it's it's OK to kill people <laughs> like he says. This is an well, anecdote I, of how Manuela Science and Simone Boulevard, how Manuela Science should have conducted herself. And I'm like, yeah, but these were real people. And you're really saying that this is how they should have conducted yourself. You're literally saying she should have murdered her husband's opponents. Like, this isn't theoretical. You're saying this is really what should have hey, happened. I, I read it. I, yeah, when I read it, it was shocking. It was as shocking as some of the stuff in Science of Survival. Yeah. Which is really got some, you know, Hubbard lays out his program of social engineering, and it is terrifying. And I'd like to, to talk about that. And uh, appreciate you coming on and we'll just we'll just leave uh, our audience with a mystery about we're going to talk about <laughs> responsibility leaders power science of survival in the next podcast and some some of the really dangerous what scientology is at the core as you know as a psychopolitical group and how the sea org plays into that yeah how the guardian's okay. office played into that okay well aaron aaron smith levin thank you so much for your time and for surviving scientology radio thank you for listening as always we'll be in good touch